Our second speaker to come up and speak about what does a bold inspiration on Creative City look like, and that is the wonderful Louise Adler. Louise Adler is the CEO of the University of Melbourne Publishing. Uh, she's the president of the Australian Publishers Association, a board member of the Melbourne Festival, deputy chancellor of Monash University, and if that wasn't enough, also the chair of the board of Methodist Ladies College. Please welcome Louise. Thank you, Leslie, and thank you to Geoffrey for initiating this discussion. So the question we've been asked to reflect on is what does a bold and inspirational creative city look like? So here are some of my thoughts in no particular order of importance. A creative city is safe, but also not safe. A creative city, and I have to thank my colleague, the editor of Meange and Zora Sanders for this idea, a creative city is open. It doesn't close down at 7 p.m. Maybe when you're her age, you want an open city, but um, I'd be happy 9 o'clock, 9.30. But anyway, that's a generational matter, but certainly open. And if we think of Melbourne and the CBD, and I hope the um, bureaucrats, all the well-meaning people at the Melbourne City Council don't take this amiss, you wouldn't call this a thriving and throbbing place after 7 o'clock at night. Forgive me. Um, a creative city offers first-rate art and cultural institutions. It offers affordable art, as um, Alice said, under 30s. We need to nurture the next generation of artists and arts consumers by giving them access to culture. And I think about the pricing of tickets, and I think we are making sure that no one in the next generation will be either able to make art or actually go and see art being made. I think that's one of the key issues we've got, which is access and affordability. We need experimental arts organisations that are publicly subsidised to take risks. We have, in a creative city, a vibrant film and television production environment and when I wrote all this, you know, this list was coming to me, I was thinking, no, 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 forgive me. I know I'm not allowed to do any buts, so I'm doing some no's instead. I think we have a way to go. <laughs> sneaky, sneaky. Cutting edge fashion. If a creative city has anything, it has creative uh, cutting edge fashion. It's home to a broad range of educational institutions, as Gideon discussed before. Universities are incubators of innovation, but those universities also have to make visible by their public engagement the dynamic engagement and relationship between what happens in universities and what happens with the research that they create in universities into the community and into industry. I have had the privilege of working with Monash University for the last 14 years. I'm dazzled by the kind of research and the impact that research has on my own and our everyday lives, from the seat belts, you know, the kind of manufacturing and testing of seat belts through to protection of child, children against child abuse, sexual abuse. It seems to me there's a myriad of fabulous work and research going on in universities that's never made public and never made visible to us, the general community that actually supports that research. I think we need to urge the universities to make that work public. It, it helps to create a creative city. A creative city also has urban design that encourages rather than discourages community. I think Federation Square is a perfect example. Melbourne, some of you are my age and know this, we were long, has, Melbourne was always a city in search of a meeting place. We tried again and again and failed to create the city centre, the plaza. But within days of Federation opening, it became our natural meeting place. I think that's really interesting to reflect upon. I don't know how it happened. I'm not an architect. But suddenly, you want to meet someone in town, you meet them at Fed Square. Cutting edge architecture always creates debate, always creates a sense of community alive and engaged with the spaces we inhabit. And I think of the fabulous Story Hall, and my, uh, many people might not agree with me, I think it's a dazzling building still, or I think of the debate we had with the goddamn shards at Federation Square. Sorry, goddamn, I know he'll strike me down. But however, that debate alone about one shard, two shards, one shard, two shards created a sense of a lively and dynamic and challenging city. A creative city needs to create the conditions for creativity, and I think, and I think we've mentioned it already, but the question of funding is the white elephant in the room. I think for people who are engaged in arts and culture and want to support it, if we don't um, yell and scream from the roof, rooftops to say that the arts need public funding, we are missing our obligation. And um, you know, people who want to go to the arts, whether you're kind of you know a venerable or you're a, you know you're Alice Pung, it seems to me really, really important for us to demand that the state funds culture. It can not happen without it. It can, I, can, I don't um, share the view, the current, current view about crowdsourcing and how wonderful it is. I think that's like volunteer, like the, um, rattling the tins at the, at the traffic lights. That's all very well and good, but that doesn't get art made and that doesn't get it seen. So I think it's terribly important for us to do that. And 
we know that the creative city needs those conditions for creativity and that the state can help us create the conditions. We can encourage clusters of activity. I think of Silicon Valley as such an obvious example, clustering of technology and technology businesses created creativity, or Hollywood for the film industry. So what clusters do we have in Melbourne? I certainly think straight away, because I'm an addict, I think of the coffee clusters we have. I mean, if we have an example of a creative and innovative culture, it's certainly, um, coffee would certainly be one idea that we could think about and how that percolates, forgive the pun, but how that percolates through the culture. We are obsessed with coffee. We know every new place that opens up. We know where a good coffee is. We have fierce arguments about it. On social media, we have apps that actually tell us if you're in Paran, you can get a great coffee here, and if you're in Northcote, you can get a great coffee there. And how that happens and how that creates a culture of innovation, and there is innovation in coffee, in the coffee culture, if you like, the coffee industry here. It's a really interesting example for those of us who want to think about it. Creativity is both an individual and collective activity, but activity, but connectivity is vital. Are we convinced that access is available to everyone, or is it still the domain of the rich, as this lady down here said at the beginning of this conversation? Not everybody has access to the digital environment. So I think that support for public digital infrastructure will do much to encourage and create physical and online community engagement. I will finish in one moment. Preparing for tonight, I read an essay by Charles Landry, Landry, who argued that great cities have contradictory elements. They offer places that are stimulating and vibrant, but are also places of calm and refuge. They offer a sense of possibility, but the, also the opportunity and the ability to close in on oneself. They offer the feeling of being at home and in the wider world. They acknowledge the values of heritage and they celebrate the new and the fresh. So I think that we have to separate the preconditions for individual creativity and those for social creativity, because I don't think they're the same thing. I'm sure the people at the Melbourne um, City Council have looked at the British Council report recently on creative cities. They made a distinction between the view that creativity is an activity for special people of special talent in special places, in the studio, in the garret, for the boffin or the bohemian. They made a, a, a specific sort of difference in view, if you like, between those people and those people who can work in collaboration with others. If, if you want, the, the, and I'm quoting from the report, if you want more creativity, you need more special people in more special places, bigger and better cultural quarters and bigger and better research parks. But they finish. Creativity doesn't always come in a flash from an individual. It comes from the recombination of two ideas to create a new one, new ideas that emerge from intense conversations between people. So I think about that and I think about that proposition. I think yes and no and I think about Alice Pung and the writing she does. She needs her time in the garret, but she also needs time, as she alluded to, spent in the world. But her writing begins in private. Sure, once the book's written and published, the connection to her readership is vital via, via electronic media or print media or in person in a dazzling array of Meet the Author events. So the production, though, remains private, but the dissemination is highly visible and public. To finish, I would argue that public funding for the creative city is vital, but creativity can't be mandated. The state can enable the preconditions for innovation rather than inhibit it, but it will be us as citizens who work out how to live together creatively. Thank you. <laughs>